Welcome to Learning DSLR Back to Basics. My name is Phil Dame. In this episode, episode 6, I'm going to be talking about three important topics. The metering of light, camera metering modes, and exposure compensation. Metering light is really the measurement of the intensity of light. And we're certainly familiar with this uh, in terms of measuring light with our own eyes. We do it without thinking. But as we go from an interior to an exterior location, often our eyes are making dramatic, or our brains are making dramatic adjustments to compensate for the amount of light coming in. And we, again, do this naturally. And we do so by looking into the source of light, more or less. We, we see the intense light and our brains adjust, or we see low light and our brains adjust. And in a similar way, a light meter, which is an electronic device that can measure light intensity, can do the same thing. And it looks right into the source of light. And so it's like a virtual eye. This is called incident light metering. And because it's looking into the source of light, it doesn't really matter if you look at this diagram, what's really behind the light meter. The fact that someone is dressed in dark clothing or has darker skin has no impact on it. It's simply measuring the light as is. Our cameras, unfortunately, um, aren't going to be standing where the subject is and looking into the light. If you're photographing a building, you can't get on top of the building and look into the sun. So you are forced to have to look at the amount of light instead that is reflected off of a subject. Um, this is also known as reflective, uh, reflective light metering or through the lens um, metering, TTL metering. And since it's reflective metering, you're of course at the mercy of the reflectivi reflectivity of the actual subject. If someone is darker skinned or wearing darker clothing, then naturally you're not going to be reflecting quite as much light. And if instead the subject is snow or sand and reflects a lot of light, the opposite is true. And so your camera has to work pretty hard to try and figure out what is the right exposure level. In this case, the amount of sunlight hitting the subject was the same, and so the exposure should not have changed. But since less light was reflected off the black clothing, it runs the risk of overexposing, because it thinks not enough light has reached the lens. So how does your camera do that? When it looks at a scene, it thinks on average that if you were to sum up all the luminosity values, that it should add up to about a middle gray. And so this picture of the house on the green fields with the blue sky and the sun, your camera looks at all of those spots, the blue sky and the grass and the building, and it says, you know, if that all averaged out to middle grade, that's probably the correct exposure. Um, and then sets your camera settings, your aperture, and your shutter accordingly. And you get a perfect picture, ideally. Problem is, is that the scene doesn't always add up to middle gray. And so your camera can get fooled, certainly in the more extreme scenes where there's a lot of white or a lot of darkness in the scene. So if that same scene was a snowy day, there's a good chance that you wouldn't get the photo exactly as you had seen there because averaging out to middle gray will cause the photo to get underexposed. It's just too much white, so it moves it towards middle gray. Let's look at this in terms of kind of more uh, extreme cases. If you were to take your camera right now and photograph an entire entire white wall or white sheet of paper and you look at it on the LCD, uh, you're going to notice that it actually comes out middle gray. It's taking the entire white surface and turns it gray. And so you can imagine that now if you put some small subject in front of that white background, the white background isn't going to become suddenly white. The whole scene becomes underexposed and you have to compensate for that or adjust for it in the way your camera is metering, which is where we get into camera metering modes. So the opposite is true. Now go find a complete black surface with your camera and take a picture of that. And you'll notice that it does not come out black. It in fact overexposes it and makes it thus brighter and turns it back into middle gray. So your camera really is pushing for an average middle gray because an all white or an all black scene is just you know, uncommon and it's not what the camera is normally metering for. So let's talk about metering modes for a moment. What I'm talking about in those previous uh, slides was average metering mode. It's looking at the entire scene and saying all of that should add up to middle gray. And that 
isn't really a mode that you can choose. It comes into play, I believe, in, in flash photography, but your camera, that would be almost too simplistic an algorithm to figure out the right exposure. And so your camera offers you various metering modes um, to compensate for different kinds of situations. The first is center weighted. And this is a very popular mode and it's been around for a long time. And it's where it's looking at the whole scene, but it's going to give a bit more emphasis to the middle, you know, third or two thirds of the image. And so usually you were pointing your camera back in the day, you know, dead center right at your subject. So that would have been, say, someone's face. And then you would have metered properly for their face. Even if the background was heavily black or white, the face was the main determining factor as to how it should be exposed. And so people are comfortable with this in the sense that you could point your camera to the person's face, you could lock in the exposure, and then you might recompose to put them off center, but you would benefit from the knowledge that there is this center weighting. And this is available. And the, diag uh, the symbol here on the right side shows you uh, what the actual mode icon would look like on your camera. This particular icon relates to partial metering mode. And this is where it's similar to center weighted, but we're not really looking now any longer at the background. And we're taking a, a 10 to 15% circle right in the center and saying, look at that exclusively. Don't look at the background. Just look at the center area, a good chunk of the center area, and evaluate that way. And it's looking for middle gray only in that circle. The next is much more precise. It's only 1 to 5% of the center of the, of the viewfinder, and that's spot metering mode. And again, this can come in very handy, certainly in really bright backlit scenes. You might put on spot metering and meter or press the shutter halfway or use your exposure lock and meter on someone's face, for example. Again, recompose, and then regardless of how much light is washing in, you know, in the backlit scene, perhaps a sunlight over someone's shoulder, you're going to get a good exposure because you've really told the camera what matters in the scene. And finally, the kind of default or uh, most popular uh, metering mode is one that is very uh, rich in terms of algorithm. There's a lot of electronic processing here. And what it's called, it's called evaluative um, metering in, in the Canon world, and I think it's called matrix metering in uh, Nikon. And what it does is your camera is splitting up the scenes into these various zones, uh, still with a center focus as well. And so if it sees the sun in the top left corner, it knows that that's a bright kind of quadrant, and it doesn't necessarily affect all the others, and it balances all out to make its best estimation as to how the, the scene should be metered. And so this is going to be your default uh, metering mode. And so you see that icon on the top or back of your camera all the time. But certainly be aware of the other metering modes because they can come in handy. But regardless of the metering modes you, you work with, your camera can still be fooled in the way I've talked about. It uh, doesn't matter which of those metering modes you work with and you go shoot that white wall or white piece of paper, you're still going to get something underexposed. It's not going to be pure white. So that, regardless of the metering mode, this is your camera thinking that it is the correct exposure, yet it produces a gray image. And that's at exposure level zero. So you see this exposure compensation um, uh, you know, chart on the top of your or the back of your camera or in the quick menu. And what you're able to do is tell the camera, look, I, I understand that uh, you think that that's a good exposure, but I know it is not. I am shooting a white piece of paper or I'm shooting a wintry scene and I want the whites to be pure white. So what you need to do is use exposure compensation and say, I'd like you to, instead of underexpose, I want you to overexpose. And so you might overexpose by one stop, which means twice as much light. And that will cause the white paper to finally look white in the final photo. And of course, one stop may, may be too much. You might be one, do one third or two thirds a stop, or maybe you need to go even higher. So how do you add a stop? What is the camera actually doing? Well, it depends on what mode your camera is in. Let's assume that you spend most of your time in either aperture priority or shutter priority. Then what's happening is that if you're in aperture priority, the only thing left to move is your shutter. So your shutter has to let in more light. So it's going to slow down the shutter. So if, for example, you had a 125th of a second shutter speed, it's going to have to slow down to a 60th, if, assuming you're going with the one stop increase. And for shutter priority, then aperture is the only uh, element left to move. And so your sh aperture is going to have to compensate by letting in more light, making the diameter of the opening larger. And if you're at the limits of either of these things, then 
uh, uh, compensating with ISO, make going from ISO 100 to 200 can have the same effect. Now, similarly, if you were to shoot the black uh, photo, black piece of paper, and as I mentioned earlier, you're going to get an underexposure, then you have to do exactly the same thing and tell your camera, no, I really want the blacks to stay true black. I know there's a lot of black in the scene. And so you ex underexpose by doing exposure compensation, for example, by removing a stop of light or having the amount of half, half the amount of light coming into your camera. And this is just the reverse of the previous situation. If you're on aperture, uh, aperture priority mode, your shutter's got to snap faster and let in less light. Or on shutter priority mode, your aperture uh, diameter has to kind of contract and get smaller. So if you were on f11, your camera might automatically choose f16 to let in less light and finally get an appropriate picture. And that's it. Uh, I hope you found that useful. If you have any questions about these topics, please post a comment here on the video or on my blog. And I do recommend that you spend time really learning your camera settings around exposure compensation. Uh, I personally find I'm using exposure compensation constantly during a photo shoot to, uh, to make sure that I'm getting as bright a photo or as a correct a photo when it comes to dark scenes as possible. If you haven't done so already, please connect with me on my blog at learningdslr.com or on the social web via Facebook or Twitter. Thanks very much for watching.